Hi, well, thank you for inviting me so much, Justin. It's really nice to be here, and it's really nice to be here where I think there'll be lots of people more earth-based than I am. So uh, it's, it's really good to, to present some of this work to you guys. Uh, so yeah, today we're going to be going on a journey to the center of the moon, and I'm going to show you how you can use lunar seismology to map our nearest neighbor. A quick outline for the talk. I'm going to give a, an introduction to lunar seismology. It's very different from terrestrial seismology, and I'm going to try and give you a flavor of that. I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the, a new archive of some Apollo lunar data that we've recently completed. And I'm going to talk about a new mission to the moon, which is the Far Side Seismic Suite, which is a 2025 mission to deploy seismometers on the moon. Uh, if anyone has any kind of quick questions that are about not following what I'm saying, please drop those in the chat. Uh, Justin did say that he would he would kind of interrupt the talk if he thought it was, it was that those kind of questions were appropriate. So um, especially if you're a bit stuck on something, then I'd rather you interrupt me now. So yeah, let's get going. So I'll just begin with um, an introduction to lunar seismology. And here we really are talking about the legacy of the Apollo missions from 1969 to uh, 1972, and then uh, so they uh, each of those missions took seismometers uh, and they placed them on the near side of the moon. And essentially, they formed a network. Several of those seismometers formed a network which was operating on the moon until 1977. So here we are, um, completely in their debt. And um, so let's just begin with um, a lunar seismogram. Um, this is a really, really typical one. Uh, some of the ones I'll show you later would be a bit nicer, but you can see kind of right from the start that uh, they're very, very different from something that you get on Earth. And like this, this record, this is an hour long record and it start, the, the event starts around here. So you can see that um, like for 45 minutes, even this tiny, tiny event, which barely breaks above the noise level, uh, is 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 kind of you know doing this crazy thing and it, you know it's it's bouncing around, um, and so yeah, let's have a think about what we can see. So, so lunar seismograms have a very distinctive shape. Um, they start with this long rise time, uh, and as it, it, it kind of you know the event starts around here and then it comes up slowly, and then you come uh, down and then you get this even longer de decay time, and it takes a long time to reach. Uh, to go back to the noise levels. There's no obvious distinctive phases. You know, it's Carrie, a bit of a yeah. If you mind, if you don't mind, if I um, if I chime in here, sure. we did have a question. Just wondering, uh, what's on the y-axis and what are the units? Oh, okay. Um, so they are um, those units are in meters. Um, so this has been um, this has been processed to be in displacement. Um, Thank you. So, um, so, and can people see my cursor, by the way? I've got to check. Can you see my cursor moving? I can, yep, cool. I see it. Great. Um, and so, yeah, we, this is, you know, this is where the event starts. Does it start here or does it start here? Uh, there are no uh, obvious distinct phases, no P, no S. Um, what's really important in terms of lunar seismology is that there's no obvious uh, later phases. Um, you know, that the things that we might be interested to say, you know, phases coming off the core, for example, it's, you know, it's, it would be basically impossible to see them, they're hidden in here somewhere. Uh, there's no surface waves on these events. Uh, they're generally very small magnitude, and as I've already said, um, they're very, uh, they can be very long duration. Some of them, you know, the larger events can be going for five hours. So that tells us something kind of right from the start, just looking at this really quite, not particularly exciting seismogram, that we have a very distinctive uh, environment on the moon, completely different from Earth. So we get this very highly scattered environment, and that fits very well, I think, with what we know about the moon, that uh, it's been bombarded by meteoroids for billions of years, and there's very few surface processes to close those, to close the cracks up, so you end up with this very kind of fractured layer near the surface. Uh, that's that, and then, and then this energy can kind of get stuck in this fractured layer. The second thing I would note on top of that is that we must have very low attenuation, because if we had this level of scatter on Earth, it would be over in ten seconds. Um, and so we must have these two things together. And again, that fits quite well with what we know about the Moon that it's it's you know a very dry environment. So so that's kind of that that's helping us so far. 
Um, so the next, uh, the next thing is about the these kind of different kind of moon quakes. Um, we is that is that my is, am I ringing or someone else? <laughs> I, I don't hear any ringing on my Okay, own. cool. It's just, <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry about that. So the um, so the the we have these different types of moonquakes. Uh, we have uh, we start with if we start thinking about deep moonquakes, um, they they there's there's this type of uh, moonquake which is kind of goes right deep into the moon. And it starts, uh, you know, it has this kind of quite distinctive shape where it starts, it goes up, and then it kind of it slows down. Excuse me, I think it is me. <laughs> I had an alarm to make myself make sure that I showed up on time, so I've <laughs> obviously used it. Um, right, so. Here we go. So we get these different kinds of moonquakes. Uh, we have meteoroid impacts. They're really common. Uh, they have this slightly more curved shape. We have some shallow moonquakes, and we have artificial impacts. And altogether, we have over thirteen thousand uh, events catalogued. So let's just spend a bit more time looking at some of them. So these deep moonquakes. Um, they're the most numerous events. They're generally very small. They have um, a very steep rise time. They, you know, they come straight up like this. Um, and again, you can't always see distinct P or S arrivals even right at the beginning. And they are estimated to be very deep. They are you know, 800 kilometers deep. Uh, with, they seem to, in terms of kind of when they're triggered, they seem to be associated with the tides. So we assume that they're triggered by the tides from Earth. Uh, they, even despite this kind of crazy shape where you know, there's kind of a lot going on here, you do get very similar waveforms from, from different events. And so in fact, these uh, rather kind of surprisingly, these seismograms can be stacked. So you can get a couple of you know, different waveforms that are doing these kind of very uh, unusual shapes and then you stack them together and then they, they can cross correlate very well. And as a result of that, we get this theory of the deep moonquakeness because the idea is that in order to get such correspondence between the two waveforms, you can't be that far apart. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it's like at the moment, one of the only ways that we can think of to explain why you would get such correspondence between these two different types, of, between two different events. And so you get the idea of, of a deep moon quake nest, which is where you get a really small region of the moon being constantly reactivated um, at, uh, you know, like frequently reactivated during the course of, uh, of the tides and the lunar cycle. So we also get the meteoroid impact. Now these are usually small, this one's quite a big one. Um, and then sometimes you get, uh, you know, the P wave, you can actually see it kind of come in um, well above the noise. Uh, and again, they're very frequent. Uh, one thing to think about in terms of meteoroid impacts on the moon is they're very different from Earth because there's absolutely no atmosphere, so there's nothing to stop them. So they just hit really, really hard. And, you know, even something quite small will make it crater. And, and the other thing which is distinctive about it is that really tiny things can actually come through. Um, so that you, you just get these kind of tiny little pits on your, you know, on, on the surface of the rocks. So it, it does behave quite differently from Earth. We also have the shallow moonquakes. Um, there's not very many of those, maybe around 28. Uh, they tend to be larger magnitude and they get this um, shear wave energy. So you, what you do see is that you, if you can see that there's a bit of a bump here and then it goes up again. And that's been interpreted as this is the P wave energy coming in and then later you get shear energy. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, different, you know, there's different frequency content once you get to this point and that that shear energy is distinct and they're estimated to be around 300 to, uh, sorry, 30 to 100 kilometers depth. So they're still kind of, they're not, you know, they're not super shallow. They're probably uh, the lower crust or upper mantle. And finally, we get the artificial impacts, which is when you decide that it's a really good idea to, uh, to impact a satellite core 
boost that into the moon. Um, and so these impacts are just so valuable because we know exactly where they where they were impacted. And we also know things like you know, what trajectory they were on, how big they are. So they're really, really valuable in terms of calibrating our lunar models. And they look like large meteoroid impacts, which of course they're actually very similar to. Um, they're not completely the same, but, but that's kind of, they have that sort of the same kind of shape um, as the meteoroid impacts. So now I'd like to just zoom in on the waveforms because I think sometimes when you think of a, um, a lunar waveform, you can, you often see this rather kind of, rather almost like rather neat shape that it kind of, it starts, it jumps up, it has a rise time, it comes down, and obviously you can see there's some scatter in it, but it's not, it, it kind of has a, a very distinctive shape. And once you start to really zoom in, so this is um, 10 minutes after arrival time, what you find is that, you, you know, you kind of, you don't necessarily see that overall shape, and it looks much more strongly kind of scattered and much more random. And as you zoom in even further, you get that even more so. So, you know, that it's kind of um, that you, you're kind of going from this really neat shape to this completely kind of random, uh, you know, presumably very strongly scattered uh, seismic energy. Carrie, could you say a little bit about how the artificial impacts are made? Uh, yeah, you take a Saturn IV booster, which you have finished with, and you deliberately crash it onto the moon. <laughs> um, you can also, they also did it with the spent lunar modules. Um, so you, you know, when you, when you finish, the, the astronauts have left, um, you, you just take, um, you take what you don't need anymore and deliberately crash it onto the moon. Now, I suspect that that's not gonna be something which is going to be allowed right now. Um, you know, that we, you know, whether our kind of our, our sort of feelings on planetary protection perhaps won't let us do that anymore. Um, but it, it, that's what they did. Um, they, they, because apart from anything else, um, you know, these signals were so strange that they, they were kind of a little bit unsure whether they were actually, you know, whether there was some problem with, for example, with the seismogram that, you know, there's, if you're actually kind of reading the wrong information. So it was, it was a decision taken really on, early on for Apollo 12 to use the, um, the Saturn IV booster and to deliberately crash it at an unknown place and the known location and the known time. And that kind of not only confirmed that these were natural signals that, you know, they weren't just some kind of dreadful problem with the seismometer, but these are real signals. So yeah, that's, that's what you do. Does that answer the question, do you think? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so we get these moonquakes. Um, they occur in very distinct regions of the moon. It doesn't seem to be that the whole of the moon is active. The deep moonquakes seem to locate to um, around uh, like halfway to the core. They're sitting at the bottom at the base of the mantle. Um, and then the shallow moonquakes uh, are sort of around the base of the crust somewhere. And then, of course, the meteoroid impacts are impacting on the surface. And our stations uh, were all on the near side, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about later. So the moon is differentiated into a crust, mantle, and core, and it has a possible um, uh, partial melt layer at the bottom of the, of, of the mantle. Um, and so it, in some ways, it seems to be quite similar to, to the Earth. It's got a slightly different structure, but it, it, overall, it's got some similarities. On top of that, we have this very strongly scattering layer uh, near, near the surface, which is, is presumably, it seems to be what's really causing the differences between lunar seismograms and terrestrial ones. So if I just show some recent models from Garcia et al. in 2019, and they just tried some different parameterizations, which I'm not going to go into, but um, there's the, the key things to, to think about is that you get very low velocities near the surface, like, you know, 100 meters a second in the top four meters. And then even below that, you know, 100, uh, one kilometer per second for the P wave in the top, like, kilometer. So it's very low compared to Earth. 
Um, and then you get probably a very strong gradient in the crust. And then maybe in the, in the near the top of the mantle, 7.6 kilometers per second to 8.2. Um, and then we, we, we don't really have data near the core. So um, it, it's, it, you know, the models don't necessarily constrain it. And in fact, the ones that do tend to use other, um, other observations rather than seismic ones, because we just don't know, like the seismic observations aren't really there. Um, I would also add that we don't necessarily see strong discontinuities. We're still not quite sure um, whether, whether the moon is very layered near the surface. Um, some of the early models suggested that they were, but I think that's sometimes just a consequence of the way that you had to do those original models, that you know the, 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 com the computational cost of doing it in a kind of more layered way wasn't, you know, it just wasn't there. You couldn't really do it. So some of the earlier models are much more, um, they're, they're much more strongly layered. Um, this is just some data which is just using the artificial impacts. And in terms of the data themselves, they're not necessarily giving any kind of strong discontinuities. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there, but I would just take it as a, a potential caveat that you can't, um, you can't necessarily say that we, we certainly don't know exactly where any discontinuities are, and we don't know that it's particularly discontinuous. And I would also say that sometimes the locations, you know, they always get quoted as a place, uh, but they may potentially be very poorly constrained. So this is some work from Stephanie Campbell from 2012, where she showed that even though we were kind of saying that we knew where these deep moon quake masks were, potentially at least some of them could have been anywhere on the moon, um, that, that they're, not, uh, they're not very poorly constrained sorry, they're not very well constrained. And then of course, that, that is also true for all, all, all of our events, apart from the artificial ones where we know exactly where they hit. So you do need to, if you're, if you're using the data for some, you know, for some other purpose, do, take, do remember to, to include large uncertainties in terms of, of how you use them. I'd also like to talk about the lunar scatter, which I think is really, it's really important in terms of, of you know, what the differences between the Earth and the Moon. And so what happens is that, as I've, as I've already said, that you get this very this scattered layer, which is probably caused by meteoroid bombardment. And that this would be like a direct path through that layer, where you just drop straight down through the layer and then, uh, and then travel through the lower, through the crust or the upper mantle, and then come straight back up again. Um, but in, you can also get quite, you, you get paths which are scattered uh, within that layer and then they go, um, they go through the, the lower mantle, sorry, through the upper mantle and then they get scattered again. Or you can get a path that's just completely stuck in that upper layer and is, is, is really strongly scattered. So it's just going you know, everywhere within that layer um, and then coming back up to the surface to be picked up at the seismogram. So we do get these very different paths, and of course, like trying to work out which path uh, any particular packet of energy has taken is 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 you know is really difficult. So uh, that means that the scattered energy obscures many of the signals of interest from the crust mantle and the core mantle boundary, and and I think that's like the major problem for lunar seismologists right now that we can, we can obviously kind of pick up the direct arrivals reasonably well, but trying to work out where those, where the waves have been and what happens beneath that direct, uh, beneath those, and what other layers we have um, and what other paths the, the, the energy is taking, but it's just very, very difficult to work out. So now I'm just going to move on. Um, to uh, some work that we've just completed, which is a new archive of the Apollo lunar data. So I, I began this work because I was interested in doing something new with uh, the, the lunar data and I needed really good timing to know what, what was happening uh, on, on the seismograms and I was trying to cross correlate them. So without knowing what the timing was, it was very difficult to do that. Um, so the problem with the, you know, the Apollo seismic data kind of before I tried this work 
was it was really difficult to get started. And what would kind of happen is that you'd ask somebody and then they'd ask someone else and, um, you know, you'd, you'd end up, you know, you'd find some a, a copy that somebody prepared themselves, but it would be pre-processed and you wouldn't know how it was processed. So it was really difficult for kind of people who were interested in the linear data to just get involved. Um, and once I'd, I'd kind of got through all this process, I thought it'd be really nice to share what I'd done with, with other people. So I do hope that's really useful. So the situation was that we, um, the original data, which was recorded on, on Earth, um, was copied from real to real tapes. Um, it was in proprietary binary format. Um, which is relatively difficult to, to use. Um, that's, there was also issues with the timing. Now these timing problems are actually intrinsic to the data. This is not somebody making a mistake, but the problem is that the, the sensor, the, the data sampler was very sensitive to temperature and possibly other uh, errors. And so the data themselves were actually recorded in a very slightly varying um, sampling frame which of course is, is not great. And it's also very difficult to use it with modern formats, which just assume that this isn't a problem and that you just, um, you, you can sample it to a particular frequency. Um, there was a couple of other versions lying around. There was one from IPGP, which was actually very easy to use, but it included these timing errors and it was also processed, which I couldn't, which meant I couldn't use it for what I was doing. Um, there was another version from the Japanese, from JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace Agency, um, and that didn't, that was actually much, that was, that was good to use, but it didn't account for these timing problems which were inherent in the data. So this is where I started. And um, the last week or so, this has been released. Um, it's now public. Um, it's available at IRIS, uh, which is really cool. It's also available at the Planetary Data System. Uh, there's a getting started page on the GitHub site, so please, you know, please go and have a look at that uh, and see how see how you get on with it. Um, there's some papers uh, associated with the understanding the instrumentation, and there's some papers which are looking at the details of the archive. So I just quickly look at the getting started site. Um, yeah, you, there's some warnings on it. There's, there's some difficulties with these data and there's nothing much we can do about it. The first thing I would say is that because there's a lot of gaps in the data, um, especially on the short period sensor, which actually has missing samples every, you know, every cycle, we just couldn't, we couldn't use the normal way of doing things. So instead we record it as, as minus one, which isn't a real value within the data. So when you first download it, it will look like this, don't panic. And um, these are all, these, these values are minus ones, but they're basically not there. So you can process that out. And there's some code uh, just to, you know, to show you how to do that. You can remove the instrument response and um, get the data as you would like it. Uh, the, the data are available with so each station, uh, for basically from when the stations when the stations were installed until 1977, and there's plenty of moments when you can't get data, um, but but overall this is the overall data availability. So it's it's a long standing network. Um, as I've said, we had this problem with the slightly varying sampling rates. Uh, and, you know, this isn't completely inherent in the data. It's not that, you know, anybody, you know, it's just a problem with the data sampler. So what I did was include a timing track. And so uh, you, if you use these data, it will always tell you what the timestamp that it was received, what, when it was received on Earth. Um, now, because, because the, the rate varies just slightly, you do find that uh, the samples do diverge slightly over time. So they should be, you know, they will be all recording at uh, midnight uh, when, when you, on the first part of the day. But as the day progresses, they're actually getting slightly further apart. And obviously it, it's fairly easy to, um, to correct for that. And, and there's an example code uh, to show you at least one way of correcting for that. But, um, but the main point is that you you have that information about the timing when it's received on, on Earth. 
with the rest of the data. So hopefully that will, um, it, in my case, I can, I really needed that to do what I was trying to do with it. So um, I, I don't know if other people will also need that, but I suspect they probably will. Okay, so the last section of the talk is on the far side seismic suite. Um, the PI is Mark Panning, and this is a NASA commercial uh, lander. It will be going, so it, it, it's being sent to the moon in 2025. Um, it's going to Schrodinger Basin, which is this just, I think this is a beautiful picture of, of Schrodinger Basin. And Schrodinger Basin is this, um, it's a, a very well preserved because it's on the moon, uh, basin with, with um, like concentric ring structures. So we get, um, it's 320 kilometers in diameter. Uh, the peak ring, the, 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 the ring closest to the center is 2.5 kilometers high and 150 kilometers in diameter. And it's only 3.8 billion years. So <laughs> it's kind of, it's pretty, uh, pretty modern for the moon. Um, one of the things I would say about it is that uh, it, it has the same structure as Chichilov, um, but of course it's better preserved. So uh, that's kind of, you know, that's another thing which is, which makes it interesting to me that we'll be able to, to look at some of the aspects of the structure of it um, on the moon. So it's, 75 degrees south, it's all the way down here, and it's on the far side. And what we're going to do is take a couple of the seismometers from that were uh, that are still currently being deployed on InSight on Mars. Uh, the most sensitive of those seismometers is called the EVB. And we're going to take uh, a vertical component, just a vertical component of this very, very sensitive seismometer, uh, the VBBZ. And we're also going to take um, the other seismometer, which is also successfully deployed on the inside, which is a short period sensor. Um, this particular sensor will be three components. So we're going to have these two, uh, two complementary seismometers, one just a vertical component, very sensitive vertical component, and another three component, which is also sensitive. Um, those two seismometers will be put together and they will be deployed on the deck of the lander. So they'll be sitting on the lander. Um, and this is a commercial lander. It's part of the NASA's CLIPS program. So our objectives are, we are really interested in whether the seismicity is different on the far side. Now, all of our original seismometers were on the near side and there were no events observed on like, all the way over here. Um, and I've always suspected that that's just simply because, you know, the, because of the network configuration um, and whether these events can come can, can, can through the core. Um, and so, uh, so this, is, this would be kind of what, what I would suspect is that, you know, once we're on this side, we'll see a very similar level of, of seismicity. Uh, so that's part of our first objective. The second part of this objective is to do with, you know, we do know that there's a lot of difference between the near side and the far side of the moon. And so, you know, like even when you just look at it from Earth, uh, when you see the Maria, which are the, you know, the, um, the lava plains, which fill the craters on the near side, they don't really fill the, near, the craters on the far side. And so we know kind of right from the off, you know, that, that the, there is these very, very strong asymmetries between the near side and the far side of the moon. So we're really interested in how that plays out in the structure, like how it, how it affects the crust, and whether there's any changes as we go deeper into the mantle and the core. Um, objective two is, uh, as I said, I'm really interested in looking at the impact processes, and we're interested in how that shapes the lunar crust inside and outside of Schrodinger Crater. Uh, I do expect that these, uh, you know, these structures are very, very complicated, so we may not be able to disentangle, I think it's unlikely we'll be able to disentangle all of them, but I do think we should be able to get a measurement for the thickness of the crust. So we can do, a, there's a few different ways we can do it. We can 
look at the thickness of the crust using our three components, seismic records and the receiver function technique, which has also been used successfully on Mars very recently. Uh, we can use continuous noise records to autocorrelate and to get the seismic reflectivity response. And finally, one thing which is quite cool about this is the Vizurek et al. 2013. They, uh, they use gravity data from the GRAIL mission. Um, and they look at the gravity across the whole of the moon and how it varies. And they come up with an estimate for the average cost. But in terms of so that but that's um, in terms of getting the average crust, you need to tie it to something, and it's currently tied to the Apollo 12, 14 seismic records. So basically, you know, we have a very good understanding of how the gravity varies around the moon. But in terms of absolute numbers, um, we're, we're just tied to this one point, which is around Apollo 12 and 14. And so by having this new seismometer, we can potentially get because basically just one more data point, but we will it, it will help us to better constrain the average cost, which I think is really cool. Um, and then finally, objective three is to look at the lunar background fog. And we think that, that uh, that's probably driven by continuous impacts of micrometeorites. Um, the, coin was, the, the term was coined in 2009 by Philip Lodgin and colleagues, so where they're looking at um, you know, what drives the, the noise on the moon. So we, we know that our, we, our instruments should record at lower noise than Apollo. And so we can basically we can use our observations to better constrain the rate for the smallest micrometeorites, um, which of course is a really long-term goal for human safety. Um, we really need to make sure that the, the any human structures there are able to withstand um, these impacts. And so we need to know, like, you know what kind of, uh, I guess the statistics of it is, is something that's really important for long-term human safety. So we can, I'll just um, talk about the, the noise floor of these two seismometers. So this is the, um, the projected performance for the moon. Uh, this orange line is the, uh, the, the highest, um, the, the basically the largest event recorded on the Apollo seismometers. So that's kind of up here. Uh, and then this is where the lowest noise that was recorded on the Apollo seismometers. And, you know, this is the gap between the two of them. And so the, the VBBZ instrument should be coming, should drop just slightly below that, should be slightly more sensitive than the lowest noise that we ever managed to see, the, the noise floor of the Apollo instruments. And so we should be able to pick up a little bit better uh, the, the the low noise of the moon, and then we also have this is where if we don't make any improvements at all to the uh, SSP, this is where it should fit, um, and we may be able to make some improvements, some slight improvements, um, and then that well actually some good improvements, and that will bring it all the way down here. So for comparison, if we look at what these instruments are doing on Mars, this is, this is the lowest, this is a low noise floor for uh, the VBB instrument sitting on Mars. And this is, um, this is from Cruise, which is when the seismometer was traveling to Mars. We got this, this was the lowest noise that we managed to record on the, on the SP instrument. So we hope that the VBBZ will be more sensitive than Apollo and that the SSP um, in theory, it should be more sensitive than Apollo above one hertz, so that's this line, and then potentially if we can make some more improvements, we can bring it down even further and it should be more sensitive than Apollo above 0.5 hertz. I would also say that there are some changes that need to be made to the instruments to make sure that they work on the moon, because the, the, the main difference is the gravity. And so if, if they're not correctly calibrated for the gravity, then they just won't work at all. So we do need to make some changes to them. But those changes are fairly minimal, and, um, and these are the instruments that are currently working on Mars.
So, and um, finally, I just like to say that we are one thing which we can do, which is really new way of locating events, is that we can. We, this is um, this is actually an image taken from Earth, and during a lunar eclipse. Uh, there were people watching on the ground just with their binoculars and several of them just saw a flash on the moon which um, is actually captured in this image i don't know if you can see it on the screen but that is uh, a meteoroid impact hitting the moon and being picked up um, by somebody observing from earth and that those those events can be picked up uh, they are picked up regularly now uh, by earth-based telescopes and so it's another cool thing where we've got we know where this, the thing hits sometimes you can see you know you can see the crater and uh and you know we, we may be able to have a time so it's like another way of calibrating our models in this case just wasn't available to the people doing the apollo missions so i'm quite excited about including that in in our work and um, we're going to be on the far side so we'll be all the way down here so it does uh, it does depend whether we can pick up all of these events, but hopefully we'll be able to do that. Um, so finally, I'd just like to talk about doing seismology in such a kind of extreme environment. Uh, the, the moon is pretty extreme for humans, and uh, you know, it's basically, you know, all the, you know we, can't, we can't live there without support. But for the instruments, some of these changes are actually in our favour, and Lower gravity than Earth um, means that we can the the instrument noise can be reduced. Um, operating in a vacuum, which of course is pretty easy on the moon, um, that again means that the instrument noise is reduced. We have higher radiation than Earth, but for this project, which is due to land for due to be deployed for four months, this isn't a major problem. We have lunar dust can be a, a major problem for these very kind of sensitive instruments, so the instrument must be sealed to prevent the dust getting in. Um, and then we are also, you know, I mentioned that we're talking about deploying on the deck of the lander. That would be, a, you know, a terrible idea on Mars because of the winds. But we do think that um, on the moon, uh, you know, at certain frequencies, we should be able to pick up um very pick up the, the 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 events very well and finally temperature which is always fun i think um this is some actual observations from apollo 15 of uh, the lunar day night cycle and i think i've given this talk before and i was like when i put this slide together i was like this is a mistake it cannot be it cannot go from minus 173 celsius to 97 celsius um, 100 Kelvin to 370 Kelvin, which just cannot be, but it can and it does. And so you get this um, huge, huge temperature variation on the surface of the moon, uh, which of course was, you know, was the problem, which, uh, you know, was was the problem for the data sampler, which was, you know, we've seen with Apollo was is still a major problem for us today, but is a problem for all instruments. So we need to do some thermal shielding. Um, the far side seismic suite will have insulation to keep it warm during the night, and then it has a little, um, like a heat pipe system, uh, which is is in loop, and that will keep it cool during the day. Um, and yeah, so conclusions. Um, firstly, before I do make my conclusions, I would really like to thank uh, many many people who've who've helped me with with this work and have you know helped me get involved with this at all in in the first place and um, particularly Yoshio Nakamura who did his PhD uh, on these with these data and still helping people today work with these very very difficult data so particularly Yoshio but um, there's many many other people who uh, I, I need to thank. So learning from Apollo um, one thing I think is really important to stress is that uh, the Apollo instruments were actually very sensitive, and it's more that the the moon is you know the moon is, is weird. The moon behaves strangely. It was nothing to do with with the instruments. And sometimes I think people can think that if you just fix the instruments, it'll all be fine and we won't have any problems. Um, but I don't think that's true. And that, you know that working with Apollo with 
lunar data is, is very different from, from working on Earth. Um, so I think it's really important to stress that now before we go back, um, we certainly don't expect things to be easy. Um, I would say that the data were very coarsely digitized, uh, which means that especially when you're close to the noise, it looks a bit like a barcode. You've got data, nothing, data, nothing, data, nothing, data, nothing. And it kind of, um, it, it, that is something we can deal with now. And I don't think that we'll have um, a problem with that. Um, but yeah, the main thing to stress, I think, is that lunar seismology is very different from terrestrial seismology. Um, that the seismic scatter is one of the most difficult problems to overcome in lunar seismology. And if we're interested in other phases, we really have to get to grips with that. Um, yeah, so so my for my final slide is uh, the far side seismic suite. Um, it's to be launched in 2025. It's a single seismic station. It's got two seismometers on it, and it will be deployed on the land after four months. And the objectives are to see whether the seismicity is different on the near side and the far side. Uh, we want to see how the impact processes shape the lunar crust inside and outside of Schrodinger Crater. And we want to look at what's the current rate of micrometeorite impacts. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiri Nunn, uh, for a wonderful talk. Let me just get my camera working here. Okay. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, I was on my own had... out there. I'm on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> we have had a number of questions come in, so I'll start working our uh, way through these. Um, I think the, the first couple ones were asking, you were showing some examples of moon quakes and different events, and there were a few questions about the frequency content. Um, and so the, the first one says, what is the frequency content? I would expect high frequencies because of low attenuation. Are the records truncated in frequencies because of the limitations of the seismometers? Okay, yes. Um, so these, uh, these pictures that I'm showing, um, the highest frequency I go to on those pictures is 0.9 hertz. Um, but actually we have other seismometers. There was another, there was actually a short period seismometer. So if you're interested in what's happening with the short period, yes, you can definitely look at those. And um, yeah, it does go to very, very high frequencies. And yeah, the the, the question asked is, is correct that, you know, it's, um, we, we get these very high frequencies and they, you know, they have a long tail. They do last a very long time, yeah. What, what was the overall range? You said high frequencies, but like about from um, what was with the lower end? Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact numbers for the short period, but it's it's all in in the paper that it kind of there's, there's definitely um, yeah, it's definitely covered like what what frequencies you can go to. I tend okay. to use the mid period. So um, another question about those recordings um, just said if you wouldn't mind repeating your initial comment on the long duration of the seismic recordings. Um, there was a question, did you say that the duration of such a signal on Earth would have been much shorter? I think maybe they had yeah, missed that no, expression. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you, um, you know, if you do get uh, signals in kind of in very, in, you know, and say like the, the sort of strongest, the, the most strongly scattered signals that we have are say in volcanic regions. And, you know, you, because you're scattering that energy, it's it's attenuated. It's not even whether it's attenuated. You just can't. You know, it's just so scattered that you can't see it. Um, whereas on on the moon, you know, this like this this energy can just keep coming back up into the onto the seismogram, and I think it's possibly that there may be some kind of very reflective layer. So even though you're in the scattering layer, there's something at that base which is sending some of the energy back up to the seismogram. So if it's it's kind of bouncing around, but if it goes down to the, the base of the scattering layer, it can come back up again. And obviously it will keep scattering, you know, as it goes, but it's still not being not kind of bleeding out into the, the moon itself, or at least most of it is. Another question here is one I had, and I know you touched on this in your talk, but uh, they write in 
how will the recordings be affected by the location of the instrument on the deck of the lander instead of on the surface? And in this case, they're thinking about the Vikings and the, um, yeah, the Viking so, landers. So, so the Viking, we don't need to panic. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, Viking was very bad and everyone knows that. Um, so the problem with, so Viking was on, you know, it's, it's a, it was on Mars and it was on the leg of uh, a Martian lander. Um, and so what happens is you see the wind, <laughs> like there is, there are no seismic signals kind of picked up at all anywhere uh, on Viking. But this shouldn't be a problem for the loom because we are, because there is no wind. Uh, but we may get, what we may get is some resonances, you know, if there's a lot of scattering, if there's a lot of scattered energy, you may get some resonances. And I'm not sure, you know, we, we think that above that when we're kind of below certain frequencies, we're going to be okay. And we've, we've kind of made certain requirements to make sure that, you know, that we won't get too much, too many resonances below certain frequencies. But yeah, I don't think, you know, I think we're certain that we don't have the same problem as Viking. Um, you know, whether exactly how much of a problem these other resonances will be, I don't think we can know until we're there because it just behaves so differently from, from Earth. Okay. We had another question about, I think, catching some of the higher frequencies from these events. And um, the question here is, is, is the 10 hertz high enough for Mars that might be okay, but for the moon, because of the low attenuation, is this, is this high enough? Will it capture the high frequency content of uh, things like meteorite impacts? Um, so we, there's not many, um, so for the, the signals that I'm interested in, which are kind of traveling quite long distances, um, the, the Apollo missions um, are peaked around 0.45 hertz. Um, so at that level, you're getting a lot of signal and it does look very scattered um, and it is very scattered. Um, but if you look at the short period at the same time, you know, you, you're also getting signal. Um, what you do get that's different on, so, so for the larger events and for these events which are traversing the moon, say from a meteoroid impact or whatever, um, you'll see those on what were the mid-period instruments on Apollo, and you'll also see them in the short period if they're recording at the same time. But you also get, on top of that, you also get these uh, local events, which are probably thermally induced, where there's some kind of thermal cracking in the surface. Um, they also picked up some stuff from the original landers, um, so the, you know, the, the land is sitting there on the surface, it's being really strongly heated. And so there may be some kind of flexing in the metal or something happening in the tanks or whatever. So you get these very, very local, very small, very high frequency events. So, so I think the question is right, that we may have some interference for some of those events um, if we're sitting on the deck. Uh, but we should, in theory, be uh, a lot safer for some of the larger events, which are, are in, in, in terms of my research, it, it's actually much more interesting. I mean, there's lots of cool things you can do with the local events, but I'm much more interested in the ones which come a lot further and traverse the moon and go like, mm -hmm. into the press. Uh, we have a question here about um, the project that you were working on that led to the creation of the new data archive from the Apollo seismic data. Um, was there, was that, would you mind just reminding us, was, was that, is there a name for that particular project? Yeah, so um, I was interested in using um, cross correlation uh, to, uh, so if you, if you like a bit similar to the kind of ambient noise studies that we use on, on Earth, uh, we, we use them really successfully to, to get the structure of Earth. You know, you can, you can read the surface waves and then get this structure. Now the problem uh, with the, the thing which didn't work with uh, the project that I tried is because uh, certainly, you know, we can say categorically we don't see surface waves in the Apollo data. Um, and I'm starting to suspect that we won't really see them at all. Uh, and the reason for that is because of this kind of such strongly scattering layer that the surface waves being um, involved, you know, it's a superposition of different waves. And that as those waves are so strongly scattered, you just don't really build up a surface wave. Um, and instead you get these kind of quite different phases. So 
the project that I was working on, um, you know, I didn't manage to get a depth profile, which was what I was interested in using these cross correlation techniques. And that's because the phase I was interested in wasn't really building up. Um, my current project is actually looking at exactly what phases do you get and trying to kind of do things with those. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's what I was trying to work on at the time. Okay. Uh, we've got a few more questions to get through here and um, maybe another uh, five or six minutes to go. Um, next question here says, how much do we know or assume about the mineralogy of the lunar mantle and how does it differ from the Earth's upper mantle? Um, so I'm not a, a, a mineralogist. Um, it's probably not. I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Um, I, and I think so that you know some of the um, some of those models that I showed did look at the you know they they're actually using what we think we know about the, the mineralogy. I mean I think I'm going to have to pass on that question in terms of like what the mineralogy is itself, but we do have some good ideas about what it might be and why it might be behaving the way that it does. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, this next question touches on the extreme temperature difference that you pointed out on the surface of the moon. And the questioner asks, does the strong variation of temperature influence the instrument responses? I know you mentioned they would be shielded, but I'm, I'm yeah. wondering good um, question. <laughs> yeah, like what, what you expect I, there. Um, so I think with our so with our new instrument, um, you know, we're really hoping to shield the instrument from the worst of those temperature variations. Um, and I don't have good calibration information from the Apollo. I mean, the Apollo the Apollo missions were shielded, um, yeah. just not to the extent that um, that didn't. You know, you can you can see the. You can actually see the, the sampling rate vary with um, the time of the lunar day. And whilst it's not completely, because if it was perfect, we just like, you know, we could just kind of read it back, but it's not, but it, it, you can see it being influenced. So yeah, I think, I think it's very likely that those, that the Apollo uh, data, you know, there is some change to the instrument response, but I don't have good calibration information to, to kind of pull that out. Okay. Uh Another question here asks, can the seismometer um, on the upcoming far side seismic suite you know, operate beyond four months? In the four months, do you have an estimate of how many shallow and deep moonquakes we can expect to see? And then also, how will the events be located with only a single station, in most cases, unclear phase picks and likely no clear polarization? Um, so we, so lunar events are very frequent. Um, and so I, I think we will we'll, we'll get plenty of, of events. Kind of, we should be able to see plenty of, of events. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, locating them is a huge problem. And um, it was already a huge problem with Apollo, as I've shown, you know, that it could, it could kind of end up being anywhere. And some of those really successful techniques on Mars where you know, use, for example, the polarization um, of the initial wave there, I think, you know, we can't use those. So that's part of the reason why I showed the information about the, um, the impacts, because if we can get any of those, uh, we can use it to calibrate, you know, like where, where like use it for, for new models for the, the far side of, of the moon. So that would be really good. Um, the, some of the techniques we don't actually need to locate uh, the events, we can, can use the, the noise and see if we can get um, responses from just sitting, you know, in one location. So that some of those techniques that we need won't necessarily need to know where where the events are. But yeah, I, I do think I think it's a problem because, um, you know, I thought it would be a problem on Mars, but it turns out not to be. That the polarization is good enough to give you a really good estimate of um, which direction the wave was coming in. But when I check on the Apollo stations. Um, you know that the, there's very little colorless information that you can that you can do anything with. So it's a good question, and unfortunately, the answer is not too satisfactory. Well, and I presume the duration of this upcoming experiment is just it's just based on the limitations of how much weight and power and things yeah. you can bring in. You're yeah, operating no, on the far side, so you don't have any solar. Uh, yeah. Solar um, so yeah, we um we should what so we we should be able to pick up solar. Um, that would be fine. We'll have solar panels, um, but we 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, these missions are, they're being put together fairly quickly um, and, you know, for NASA relatively cheaply. And so, you know, they are, like you say, there's a mass and power limit. Um, our instrument, you know, some, sometimes these instruments kind of go on a long time past their intended okay, time. Sure. But, you know, we, we think that our, our instrument's designed to last for a few months. Okay, all right. Um, with regards to those data that you'll be collecting, how, how is this data going to be transmitted from the far side of the moon to the Earth? Uh, yeah, so we should, um, we'll need a relay satellite. Um, and I think the, the relay will be sitting, um, it's almost like behind the moon. It's kind of, you know, you can get into a stable, you get into a stable orbit mm -hmm. on the other side of the moon, and then, um, and then you can transmit to back back to Earth, um, and we'll be able to store the data until we're able to connect with. So it's not it's we don't need a continuous transmission. We can store the data, sure. send it, and then you know if we if we if we fail to send it, then we may lose some. But um, but we can certainly store it for a while and then transmit it to the relay satellite, which then transmits it back to Earth. Okay, um, you have a question here about the uh, moonquakes, is the gap between shallow and deep moonquakes real or is that a location artifact? Uh, ooh, that's a lovely question. <laughs> this is what I spend my life looking at. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's, it's a very consistent, you know, these, these data have been looked at for 50 years um, and nobody's ever suggested that there's a, some kind of continuum. Um, it does also seem to be the case that, uh, you know, they're being triggered by different types of, of, you know, of, of events. So the, the deep moonquakes are tidally triggered and shallow moonquakes don't appear to be. So, um, so they're perhaps more, slightly more, you know, some kind of settling tectonic kind of activity, obviously not plate tectonics, but some kind of tectonic activity to do with one suggestion is that it's to do with flexing of major craters that you know, as they settle, they um, there's some kind of flexing around the edges of them. So yeah, possibly, who knows? But and it's certainly <laughs> what I'm kind of what I'm definitely interested in. Um, it's a great question. <laughs> Keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, there's a question next about the uh, why is the wave velocity so much lower close to the surface, and what does this tell us about the material? composition i guess th this is the fractured layer that yeah you're saying you're... so it's not clear so i would um you know the very close to the surface is dust so that's not that surprising and you know it tends to get you know it, it, it's quite thick you know like you know four to ten meters that kind of thing so a very very dusty layer so that doesn't seem that surprising um below that uh it may be so it's possible that it's to do with um you know that the, the fractures that it basically can't get a direct path um yeah it, it is a bit surprising that it's as low as it is um yeah one suggestion is you just can't get a direct path um and then you know, yeah potentially it's yeah i think it's um i think it's a little bit you know we're not totally because I think when I first started looking at this, I just assumed you could kind of look it up in a lab. And um, that doesn't seem to be the case, that there is this kind of low velocity layer, which is, um, yeah, just not comparable to anything that we can see on the Earth. Okay. Maybe one final question to close out. Um, are you able to say anything about the focal mechanisms of the earthquakes uh, or the moonquakes recorded or because of the the scattering and whatnot is that is that an intractable problem i think it's at the, the at this stage it's intractable yeah. with the new upcoming uh far side is do you expect to have data clean enough that you'll be able to attempt that i don't know because uh, so i'm currently doing some simulations where i'm kind of playing around with the focal mechanism to see what i can what mm -hmm. i can kind of pick up um uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, you've got a, again, single station, um, strongly scattered direct wave. Yeah, I don't think it's, I think it's fairly unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, We'd love I to. Think, <laughs> I think we'll have to, we'll have to leave it there. But um, again, Dr. Dr. Carrie Nunn, just want to thank you so much for, uh, for your time today and for sharing this 
this research with us. I'm sure we'll all be watching uh, with great excitement to see yeah. uh, the car <laughs> I, I don't think I'll be watching. I'll be too nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll look forward to, to seeing those data and, and the results that come from them. So thanks again. Cool. Thank you.